Hello and welcome to this edition of Back in History. In this edition, we continue with our series on the Nigeria Biafra War, the war that lasted from 1967 to 1970, and when it ended, more than 3 million lives were lost and countless property destroyed. It was a war that inflicted indelible marks on the psyche of the people of the eastern region and of Nigeria as a whole. In this episode, we take you to the battlefield and narrate to you the critical events that characterized the war. Again, we shall rely on the accounts given by persons who were directly at the war front fighting for their respective sites. These persons include Olusogun Obasanjo, who was the commander of the 3rd Marine Commando of the Nigerian side. He is the author of the book My Command, an account of the Nigerian Civil War, 1967-1970. Philip Effiong was the second in command to Ujuku and was the officer in charge of Biafra when Ujuku departed to Ivory Coast in the course of the war. He is the author of the book Nigeria and Biafra, My Story. Alexander Madiebo was the chief of army staff of the Biafran army. He is the author of the book The Nigerian Revolution and the Biafran War, The Aftermath. These authors have given accounts of the war from their individual perspectives and from what they had experienced directly, but they are all in agreement about most of the events that characterized the war. We acknowledge and appreciate them for documenting these accounts in their books for history and posterity. Lieutenant Colonel Emeka Odumegu Ojuku declared the independent state of Biafra on the 30th day of May 1967. Having made a declaration and having told the people of the Eastern region in his declaration speech to discontinue their allegiance to Nigeria, it was expected that there will be a reaction from the Nigerian side. Ojuku knew this very well and thus made preparations for war. He thus mobilized his men and ammunition for the prosecution of the war. He created military commands and appointed commanders. Most of the commanders were soldiers who had served in the Nigerian army but had returned to the east following the spate of violence and killings against Easterners in the north. They formed the new clause of Juku's initial warming. The federal side was also prepared for the war. They had a standby army already and had sufficient ammunition to deploy in commencing and prosecuting the war. They made placements for more arms and ammunition. Maps were drawn on both sides to give a road map on what to expect and where to attack. In other words, the two sides were ready to engage each other in combat. While Ojuku was prepared to fight and keep Biafra as an independent state, the federal side was ready to fight and destroy the dream of Biafra. While the federal side was commanded through out the war from Lagos, the Biafran side was commanded first in Enugu and later from Umahia. The battleground throughout the war was the area that was declared as the independent state of Biafra, the area that formed part of the then eastern region of Nigeria, namely the Ibo area, the Rivers area, the Efik, Ibibio, and Ogoja areas. These areas bore the greatest brunt of the war. There was an incursion into the Midwestern region by Biafran forces led by Lieutenant Colonel Victor Banjo heading towards Lagos but the incursion was halted by federal troops and for the remaining months of the war the AP center remained in the eastern region. The army headquarters in Lagos did not expect that the war would last beyond one month. They had expected that Biafra would be crushed in no time but Biafra proved not easy to crush. There was fire for fire. Selected tarred roads in Biafra were converted to runways for planes to land and take off. One of these was the Uli airstrip. Through these airstrips, giant planes were able to land in Biafra and supply weapons for the Biafran troops from Biafra sponsors abroad and from purchases made directly by Biafra. They also brought relief materials to Biafra. When Biafra ran short of weapons to continue the war, they resorted to locally made weapons, one of which was the popular Obunigwe, which was a combination of broken bottles, 
sharp nails and other sharp objects or metals which when detonated caused maximum and irreparable injuries and death to the invading side. It was Biafra's homemade bomb and it was a wonder to behold. A power was also deployed and several important places were bombed and scores of persons killed on both sides. Through the combination of conventional warfare and locally made warfare, Biafran forces were able to sustain the war for 30 unbroken months. On their path, the federal troops also deployed massive air power and made use of other conventional warfare in engaging in combat with the Biafran forces. It was indeed a hard-fought war on both sides, with scores of humans killed, soldiers and civilians alike. The federal troops invaded the Ugoja sector of Biafra and had serious control of the area till the end of the war. Their first attacks occurred in Gakem and Obudu areas of the Ugoja sector. They also attacked and captured Nsuka, which was in the heart of the Biafran command. As noted earlier, the war commenced in earnest on 6th July 1967, and by 15th July 1967, Nsuka had completely fallen into the hands of the federal troops. This was a serious blow to Biafra. Biafran troops withdrew with immediate effect to OP Junction and took a defensive position. Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Eze was the commander of the Biafran side at Nsuka at the time. In no time, the federal troops overran OP Junction and the Biafran troops dispersed. OP was a critical junction to Biafra and the loss of control of the junction to federal troops meant that Enugu, the seat of power, and the Biafran High Command was seriously threatened as that could be the next place to be captured. At the battle in Nsuka, Ojuku's half-brother Tom Biga was killed. This was devastating to Ojuku and Biafra in view of Tom Biga's involvement in the planning and preparations made for the war. It was also during the battle for the soul of Nsuka that Major Chukuma Kaduna Nzeogu, leader of the first military coup in Nigeria, was killed. Obas Njoy in his book, My Command at page 24, has stated that Nzeogu was killed on the 26th day of July 1967 by federal troops of 21 Battalion, while Nzeogu was carrying out a close night reconnaissance of the federal troops with a view to encircling them. Obasanjo noted further that, quote, Nzeogu's body was conveyed to Kaduna and buried in full military honors, end of quote. Also killed in the Nsuka battle was the legendary poet, Christopher Okibo. Okibo is said to have shown excessive bravado by daring the federal troops without weapons to match the troops. On 9th August 1967, the Biafran troops made an incursion into the Midwestern region. They moved up to Ure and continued their advance until they were overrun by the federal troops. The Midwestern region was not part of Biafra. The incursion of the Midwest by Biafran troops was thus a surprise to many. Philip Efion, Ojuku's second in command, has noted in his book Nigeria and Biafra My Story at page 196 that the invasion of the Midwest by Biafra was a misadventure that was not necessary. He described it as, quote, a blunder militarily, politically, and diplomatically, end of quote. The invasion was commanded by a Yoruba man, Lieutenant Colonel Victor Banjo, who was a bosom friend to Ujuku and who was imprisoned in the East on the orders of the federal government long before the declaration of war and got released from prison on the orders of Ujuku. His second in command was an Igbo man by name Fesu Zakaga. Ujuku's idea for the invasion of the Midwest was for him to distract the federal troops and avoid their capture of Enugu. His thinking was that when the Midwest is attacked, the federal troops will become concerned about a possible advancement to Lagos and will thus see the futility in the war and call for negotiation. Orojuku was wrong. Biafra, however, had the upper hand when Victor Banjo 
and his troops successfully captured Benin in the Midwest. Ojuku and his men were happy, but the joy was short-lived. On September 21, 1967, federal troops under the command of then Lieutenant Colonel Motala Mohammed retook Benin and went on to liberate the rest of the Midwest. It was indeed a misadventure for the Biafran side. The next place in Biafra that fell to the federal troops was Enugu, which was the seat of power. Lieutenant Colonel Theophilus Danjuma was the commander of one brigade which was detailed to capture Enugu. The federal troops did not have their way easily, but they eventually captured Enugu, the heart of the Biafran rebellion. This was a devastating blow to Biafra. It appears that Ojuku had foreseen the fall of Enugu owing to the quick advancement of the federal troops, and for this reason, he had ordered in advance for the relocation of the command headquarters from Enugu to Moya. In his book, Nigeria and Biafra, My Story, at page 211, Philip Ephion has noted thus, quote, Shortly after the fall of Enugu in September 1967, there was massive movement of people along Enugu Agu Road. There was also in the minds of the people serious doubt about their survival as individuals. The survival of Enugu was a symbol of hope and its easy collapse was therefore symptomatic. In any case, Biafra was collapsing too fast for comfort since the start of hostilities in July 1967. Nsoka, Opie Junction, Ukege, and now Enugu had all collapsed at tremendous cost in terms of manpower losses to Biafra. End of quote. Despite the collapses of these key places, the war did not end. Hojuku was alive together with his armies and the spirit of the war was still alive. It is clear that even before the commencement of hostilities, Ojuku had a plan B in mind should his first command headquarters be captured. Ojuku re-strategized, moved his headquarters to Omoha and created new directorates that were intended to assist him in fighting and prosecuting the war. The directorates were the Directorate of Food, Directorate of Housing, Directorate of Transport, Field Directorate, Clothing Directorate, Research and Production Directorate, and most importantly for Biafra, the Propaganda Directorate. This directorate settled in at Omaha and assisted Ujuku in several ways in the prosecution of the war. As Ujuku re-strategized, the federal troops also re-strategized. The war was still on with each side working so hard to outsmart the other and bring the war to an end to the glory of the conquering side. While Ujuku was in Umoya with his men, Calabar was attacked by federal troops. This was on 17th October 1967. There was serious air bombardment and gunboat fire from the waters of Calabar. The Biafran troops, which was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Eze, responded quickly and with the deployment of the firepower of Ubunigwe, Biafra's locally made bomb, the federal troops suffered serious casualties. Biafra also recorded serious casualties, but Calabar was successfully captured by the federal side on the 19th October 1967. The federal troops advanced further and captured Itu in present day Akwaibom state and Ikorikben also in present day Akwaibom. Ikom in present day Cross River state had earlier fallen to the federal troops. The fall of Calabar, Itu, Ikorikben, Uyo and Ikom was a devastating blow to the Biafran war plan and strategy. These places were major gateways for supplies to Biafran troops, and the capture of these critical places was no good omen for Biafra. Mercenaries were brought in by Biafra to fight in these places, and their actions only alienated the civilian population from the Biafran cause. Later in 1968, Aba, a very important town in Biafra, also fell to the federal troops. Biafra had fought so hard to the surprise of many, but they suffered serious defeats in most places in the hands of federal troops, 
who had more weapons and personnel who had all along been preparing, even from school, for war. Uzuakoli Nye Umoya was captured in 1969 under the command of then Major Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida. The federal troops took control of Uzuakoli, but on 4th March 1969, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida was fatally wounded. He was then evacuated to Lagos for treatment, and in his place, his classmate and friend, Major Maman Vatsa, was appointed to take charge of the command. The federal troops then continued to mount pressure on Biafran troops. Biafran troops on their part did not relent. They fought really hard. The river's area was also a serious battleground. This area was critical for both Nigeria and Biafra. It was this area that had vast oil reserves. The river's area extended to Boni Island, which has vast oil and gas reserves till this day. Biafra was not ready to lose rivers and the federal troops were not ready to lose rivers. Rivers became a serious battleground, and this was seen in the massive destruction of properties in Port Harcourt, the heart of river states. Olusokun Obasanjo was appointed by the federal government to command the third marine commando of the Nigerian side. His area of operation saw him residing in Port Harcourt and commanding the troops and joining them at the war front from there. On his first arrival in Port Harcourt Airport, he was received by the then military governor of River State, Dieter Spiv, and members of his cabinet. Biafra also had its commanders in the rivers area. The battle raged on, but Port Harcourt and other parts of rivers areas fell into the control of the federal troops. Bonny Island, together with its oil fields, were also captured by federal troops. The war went on, with both sides still in high spirits, but the federal side was obviously better armed and equipped for the war. But for the ingenuity of Biafrans, who used local materials to manufacture military hardware, to the surprise of all, the Biafran side could have long been completely overrun by the federal side that was better equipped with modern warfare and well-trained combatants. The federal troops continued to advance and eventually captured Uwerinta Junction. Their plan was to link up with Umoya and Bende. This was a dangerous reality for Ujuku and his men. Ujuku then made spirited efforts to draft troops, armored vehicles and guns to the defense of Umoya. But the federal troops were already knocking at the gates of Umoya. Note that at that time, there was no GSM communication in Nigeria and Biafra. Fighting became intensified and Umoya, Biafra's stronghold after the loss of the first stronghold could barely be defended further. As at 11th January 1970, the 13th Brigade of the Nigerian Army was able to advance seriously into Awomama in Umoya and at this point Ujuku came to the conclusion that he was at the verge of being captured and thus decided to leave Biafra with some of his key men and their families and travel to Ivory Coast where he remained in exile for 13 years. He handed over the reins of Biafra to Major General Philip Fion and instructed him to keep the flag flying and fight for the success of Biafra. He flew out of the country through Uli A Strip, one of the wonders of Biafra. As of 12 January 1970, Oguta Uli A Strip Atta, Olu, Uga had all been captured by the federal troops. So much destruction had been done to the Biafran troops and to the psyche of Biafrans. It was at this point a hopeless situation and, moved by the need to let the people breathe, the remaining Biafran hierarchy met and decided to authorize Philippe Fion to announce a surrender. In the evening of 12 January 1970, Philippe Fion in his capacity as the officer administering the Republic of Biafra, called the Biafran troops to disengage from the war. At exactly 4.40 p.m. on the said 12th January 1970, Major General Philippe Fion took to the microphone at Radio Biafra and announced the total surrender of Biafra with immediate effect. 
This was followed by the signing of the surrender documents before Lucio Gonobas and Joe command of the 3rd Marine Commando of the Nigerian side. Following the surrender and signing of the documents at the field, Lucio Gonobas and Joe notified the army headquarters in Lagos and called for a jet to enable him to take the leaders of the now defunct Biafra to meet with General Yakubu Gawon at Dodan Barracks, which was the seat of power, to finalize the surrender protocols. The plane landed in Port Harcourt and conveyed the representatives of Biafra to Lagos. Those in the entourage with Philip Efion included Sir Louis Mbanefo, who had served as the Chief Justice of Biafra, Patrick Amadi, David Gunewe, Mr. Okeke, who served as the Inspector General of Police of Biafra, Professor Eni Njoku, M.T. Mbu, Professor Chike Obi, and a few others. On arrival in Lagos, Philip Efion performed the final and ceremonial handing over to General Yakubu Gowan in the presence of his cabinet members and senior military officers. This brought to an end Ojuku's struggle to bring the independent state of Biafra to reality. In his speech accepting the surrender, Gowan declared no victor, no vanquished. The Nigeria-Biafra Civil War of 1967 to 1970 was a bitter war with heavy losses of lives and property on both sides. It remains one of the darkest spots in the history of Africa and of mankind. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to this channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video. I remain your friend and host, Ekemini Udima.